my trainer is uh, very much concerned that I have too much stress in my life. And so she advises me to minimize that stress on how I watch the Steeler games because I do get stressed out watching them. And so I TiVo them. And then I can skip through the commercials. But Vess will come in the room and she'll say, wait a minute, you're in real time now. I said, yeah. I said, because what I do is I start to watch the rewind, the replay, then I flip ahead to see what the score is. (laughs) And that eliminates all the stress. So I can watch the thing with comfort, knowing how everything's going to turn out in the end. And so it's fun, I have found, to watch football games when you already know the final score, except when we lose. Then I have lost my desire to watch that unfold. But that, I tell you, to illustrate a point that when we deal with the problem of suffering, we have a tendency to have our gaze completely locked on the present. Back in the 60s, the decade of the 60s, I lectured on this a few weeks on our Wednesday night series, there was a professor from Harvard by the name of Harvey Cox who wrote a book entitled The Secular City. And of course, he was writing a book with that title, borrowing from Augustine's famous work on the city of God. And in analyzing the contemporary church and the culture of America, Dr. Cox came to the conclusion that America is best defined by a philosophy of secularism. And he went on to define what secularism is. The word secular is a perfectly harmless and neutral word that it has a positive meaning in church history, particularly in the Middle Ages when you had priests who were ordained to be so-called secular priests. They ministered to the sick and to the poor and to the hungry and were not uh, doing the actual services in the church. The term secular originally referred to this world. And it was distinguished from the Latin word mundus, because both words mean world, but the word mundus refers to this world in terms of this place. But the term saculum refers to this world in terms of this present time. And as I said, the word is secular is pretty tame until you tack a suffix on the end of it by which it now is no longer harmless. When you speak of secularism, you're speaking of some kind of philosophy or some kind of worldview, and the very essence of secularism is found in this thesis, that all there is is the hic et nunc, the here and the now the temporal. There is no realm of the eternal. And so once you're convinced of that perspective, you learn to focus your attention on this world, on this time, and you hear advertisements declaring that you only go around once And so grab all the gusto you can. You see bumper stickers that boast, he who dies with the most toys wins. All of this within the perspective of the secular, secularism. But if we are Christians, we are called to think in terms of what the philosophers call the perspective of subspecies aeternitatis, that we are to consider the present in light of the eternal. 
And this is what Jesus preached again and again. What does it profit a man if in this time and in this place he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? And what will he give in exchange for his soul? We're told the parable of the rich fool who in the midst of his prosperity was experiencing such phenomenal growth. He said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And Jesus said, thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. Now, we sometimes lay out plans for our own future, what we're going to be doing next week, next month. Some businesses have five-year plans, and I've often asked people, what's your hundred-year plan? Where are you going to be and what are you going to be doing a hundred years from now? Well, the Bible gives us an answer we're still going to be alive. And we'll either be in heaven or we'll be in hell. But we are told that the end defines the significance of the beginning. And God alone knows the end from the beginning, but in the precious Word that He has given to us by His divine superintendence in the Bible itself, God, as it were, lifts the veil into the future and gives us an opportunity to see the end toward which we are moving. And if we can focus our attention on the end instead of on the now and the pain we experience here, then that which we experience in the here and now pales into insignificance. I think we all love the book of Revelation. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the Isle of Patmos where John was in his exile when the Lord appeared to him and gave him this revelation in which he peeled back the curtain and let John have this vision for what was to come. And I particularly like the last two chapters of the book of Revelation where we get the unfolding of the new heaven and the new earth. And I'd like to call your attention to the beginning of chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. John writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And then as he describes for his readers what he observed in this vision, the very first thing he tells us about what he notices in this new heaven and the new earth was this. There was no more sea. When you look at the globe of the world, it's blue predominantly because so much of the area of this planet is covered with water. So much of our time is concerned with the sea, vacations. We have our snowbirds that we love who come down here every year for the sunshine and also for the opportunity to go to the beaches, to enjoy fishing, sunbathing, and swimming. But the Old Testament Jew didn't have a Florida to go to. They didn't have beaches. Their sea coast was rocky and completely unsuited for maritime travel. 
In fact, the sea was the source of much of their suffering. The enemies that did have fleets of ships like the Phoenicians would attack them from the sea. But even without human opposition, the fierce winds of the Sirocco that came off the Mediterranean and across the desert were so destructive to life in Israel. And if you look at the image of the sea in the Psalms, for example, and in Hebrew poetry, you will see that it is altogether negative. The sea roars and is troubled. Its waves beat against the mountains. That's an ominous vision, isn't it? And as the psalmist contemplates that, in spite of the threatening character of this, the ferocity of the sea, he said, nevertheless, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the habitation of the Most High. Look at it in the imagery of the Bible. The sea is gruesome and threatening, filled with violence and suffering. But the river is the source of life. It are the tributaries of the Nile that keeps life going in this arid land and even provides underground opportunities for the well from which people get their water to drink but not the sea. And John said, I looked at the new heaven and the new earth, and there wasn't any sea. No more threat from the Leviathan or the Seminole. That was the question somebody asked after the lecture this morning. Why did God ever make a seminal? That's what people in Central Florida can't understand. John continues, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Just about three weeks ago in this building, I had the unspeakable pleasure of marrying my grandson to his fiancée. And you know, the, the most significant fruitful moment of any wedding is when the organ music modulates from the music that is used for the procession of the bridesmaids, and all of a sudden, the organ changes to the fanfare for the procession of the bride. The mother of the bride stands, everybody else stands, we all look at the back of the church, and there's the bride on the arm of her father, smiling from ear to ear, in the most beautiful gown that she will ever own, and she will save for years and years and years and years. And her husband is awaiting her as he she comes down the aisle, and he hasn't ever seen her before in this apparel. And his chest is bursting with pride as he looks. I remember my own wedding. I'll never forget, standing there watching Vesta come down the aisle in her bridal gown. John said, I see the holy city, and she's adorned like a bride. It's the bride of Christ. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, 
Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Did you hear that? I tell the story, I've preached on this passage many times. When I was a little boy, life was tough. There was a boy in our community who was so much bigger than I was, and he was a bully. I don't know how many times he beat me up. And when he would beat me up, I would come running home, and I'd be crying, and the tears would be coming down my cheeks. and. I wanted to see my mother, and my mother would be in the kitchen, and she'd have her apron on, and she'd come and say, come here, and I'd come in, and she'd take the edge of her apron, and then she'd lean over, and she'd wipe away my tears. One of the most tender forms of communication that human beings can have. I've been in the hospital with people who were dying and have had that privilege to wipe away their tears. And when my mother wiped away my tears, beloved, I was truly comforted, and I was encouraged to go back into the battle. My uncle who lived there was a tough guy, and he said to me, if you ever come home again crying from that guy, he says, I'm going to give you something to cry about. He said, next time he gives you a hard time, he said, you punch him out. And I said, yeah, you punch him out. He said, too big for me. But I'd go out back out, and sooner or later, I'd get hurt again, and I would cry again, and my mother would have to wipe my tears away again. But when God wipes away your tears, they never flow again for eternity, unless, of course, their tears of joy. So when God, who is going to make His dwelling place with us, the new Jerusalem, the first thing He does is dry away the tears. You see, that's the eternal perspective. That's the end from the beginning. Right now, we live in the valley of tears. But that situation is not permanent because God will wipe away our tears. And He says, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And what will there be no more? No more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. Death, sorrow, crying, pain all belong to the former things that will pass away. I can, rem- I can imagine having conversations with you in the New Jerusalem. And we say, remember back then when we used to worry about the problem of suffering? And I say, well, I hardly remember what that was. Oh yeah, that's, you know, when people died? But there's none of that here. No disease, no war, no pestilence, no pain, no sorrow, no death. Because that all belongs to the former things that have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said this, Behold, I make all things new. 
And he said to me, write. Don't miss this, John. Write it down. For these words are true and faithful. I tell my people at St. Andrews all the time, it's the easiest thing in the world to believe in God. It's the hardest thing in the world to believe God. But now Jesus is saying, John, I want you to write this down because what I'm telling you here, these words are true. They're not a myth. They're not a fairy tale. These are faithful words. I am making all things new. And in that realm, No tears, no sorrow, no pain, no death. And then he said to me, it's done. For I am the Alpha and the Omega. We use the Alpha and the Omega to adorn the side doors of our sanctuary so that every time we walk in those doors, we see that symbol of Christ, who is the beginning, and He's the end. He is the ultimate telos, the ultimate goal or purpose for by Him and through Him and for Him are all things. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then one of the seven angels, who had seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, come here. You want to see the bride? Would you like to look at the lamb's wife? And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a precious stone, like jasper, clear as crystal. She had a great and high wall with twelve gates, twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And he goes on to describe the streets of gold and all of the precious jewels that have adorned his wife. And in verse 22, we read about something else that was missing. Not only was there no sea, but something unthinkable to the Jew is spelled out in verse 22, but I saw no temple in it. What? Mount Zion? The New Jerusalem? The holy city? How can it be the holy city without a temple? It's the reason we go to Jerusalem, to go to temple. So that was the former things that passed away, but the new Jerusalem has no temple. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Every time I walk in this sanctuary, I'm breathless by its beauty. 
and by how it calls attention to the majesty and the glory of God, and that was by design. But this church will be passe in the New Jerusalem because we'll be in the presence of God and of the Lamb. And this, it gets better. Wait, there's more. Here's what else the city lacked. There wasn't any sun. Where's the sun? How am I going to know whether I'm east, west, north, or south? Where's the sun? There's no sun. There's no moon. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. You know, I've often wondered if there really is the sun, but you can't notice it because it passes into significance by virtue of the refulgent glory of God and of the Lamb. The dazzling brightness of their glory dwarfs the sun and the moon and all other artificial forms of illumination. We get glimpses of that, don't we, in the Bible? When the glory of God suddenly explodes on the plains outside of Bethlehem, and the the shepherds are sore afraid because this light is so overwhelming, the glory that cloud that rested on the tabernacle, the Shekinah cloud, gives a hint of the brilliance of that light that we will be enveloped in in heaven. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates will not be shut at all by day because there's no night there. No need to shut out anybody because anybody that's a threat to the saints of God will be in the lake of fire. There won't be a police force. There won't be an army except the heavenly host. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me the pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal. Shall we gather at the river? Yes, we'll gather at the river. The water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And when the tree of life heals your pain, it is healed. You don't have to go for a five-year checkup. You are healed forever. And there shall be no more curse. You know that song, Joy to the World, I love it every Christmas time when we sing the carols, and that one line in there, far as the curse is found. How far is that? In this present darkness, the curse extends to the end of the earth to our lives, to our labor, to our business, to our relationships, all suffer 
under the pangs of the curse of a fallen world. That's why there's a cosmic yearning where all of the creation groans together waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, waiting for that moment when the curse is removed. And in the New Jerusalem, there aren't any weeds, there aren't any tears. The earth does not resist our plows because the curse cannot be found. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And here it is. The highest hope, the most incredible promise that we are given in the New Testament is the promise that John in his earlier epistles say, Beloved, we don't know yet what we're going to be. You know, people ask me, will we be old? What will our age be in heaven? What will we look like? Will we know everybody? And all that stuff. John said, we don't know yet what we will be. But this much we know. We will be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Not by way of theonomy, not by way of cloud, not by way of burning bush, not by way of symbols on a church window, but we will see Him in the fullness of His glory as He is. The one thing that is prohibited from us for all of our lives as we can come close to the Lord, we can sense His presence, we can talk with Him, but His face cannot be seen. And so the three-year-old child says to her grandfather, countenance, countenance, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and may He lift up the light of His countenance among you and give you His peace. That's the beatific vision, the vision of God that is promised to every believer. If we persevere and we go through the pain and the suffering of this present world and of this present time, what is waiting for us on the other side is the vision of God. Can you you imagine it? Can you imagine looking into the unveiled glory of God for one second? It would make every pain I've ever experienced in this world worth it to see that. Every Sunday morning, we come together for worship, and the Word of God tells us that we don't enter in simply into earthly tabernacles or earthly mountains that can be touched with hands, but we enter into the heavenly sanctuary, into the very presence of God, into the presence of Christ, into the presence of angels and archangels, in the assembly of human beings on high, of the the spirits of uh, just men made perfect. I get criticized in the academic world all the time for being an unreconstructed Aristotelian because of my particular penchant for logic, which I think is a wonderful tool that God has given us to keep us from making silly errors and silly inferences from the Bible that aren't warranted. But what most people don't know about me is that there's a whole lot of the mystic in this mind, so I think about this stuff all the time. I just, I can't wait. 
I love coming into church on Sunday morning and knowing that we're this close to heaven, that every time we worship here in the presence of God, we get a taste of heaven. A taste that has so much savor that we long for the full banquet that God has prepared for us in His heaven. They shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There be no night there, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And again he said to me, these words are faithful and true. Not salve or opium to dull our present pain, but the truth of Almighty God who made you who knows you, who by the suffering of His servant Son has redeemed you. He has now guaranteed that you are bound for glory, and nothing can derail that train. So these former things that cause us so much grief will pass away, and He will make all things new. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You give us a glimpse of the end from the beginning, the hope that makes us not ashamed, the promise that You have a future for Your people and that Your redemption is complete, that You save us body and soul, and have prepared us for eternity without pain.